I would like to now invite our second speaker, uh, Mr. Shabir Ali, to make his presentation on the topic at hand today. Was Paul the founder of Christianity? Mr. Ali. Hello, everyone. Peace be with you. The mercy and blessings of God. Now, the topic before us is a very complex one, but I want to st start with some simple observations. There are three religions which are grouped together in the study of the world's religions, that is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They are called Western religions, as distinguished from the religions of the East, which include Hinduism, Buddhism, and the Chinese and Japanese religions, and others. Now, these three Western religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, are said to have a common historical origin. They share many similar ideas and uh, a very similar world view. But as we study these three religions, we notice that Christianity is very different from Judaism and very different from Islam. And uh, while Islam and Christianity shares many things in common, Islam shares many things uh, in common also with Judaism, but there are a few points in Christianity that stand out as different from these two other faiths. Um, for example, the uh, Christian attitude towards law. And uh, second, the Christian attitude towards uh, Jesus in particular and the question of monotheism on the whole. And third, the uh, Christian uh, theology of the cross. These are three areas in which Christianity stands out as being very different from Judaism and from Islam. Now, we want to ask, ask why. And um, if, as we focus on the life of Paul, we'll come to some of the answers to these questions. Now, I am a Muslim, that is obvious enough, and uh, I respect both Islam and Christianity as two of the world's uh, great religions. And the followers of these religions both believe in goodness, they both believe in doing what is right, in pleasing God. And uh, followers of both of these religions are sincere persons trying uh, their best to uh, gain the pleasure of God and to have an eternal abode in the presence of God. I don't want that anything I say, say here today should be taken uh, as de de detracting from uh, this uh, noble recognition to begin with. My commitment to one of these great religions does not entitle me to disrespect the other of the two. And in fact, I hold both in great esteem. And I believe also that the mercy of God is wide enough to accept from every nation and from every people those who are doing their best to serve him and to obey him, to seek his guidance. We recognize that people are very different. Um, we have ha had different sorts of upbringings, of uh, training and uh, experiences. And all of this shapes the way we think of the world and, and the way we see God. And, uh, uh, of course, the options uh, that one has is uh, sometimes limited because of all of these uh, different reasons. And I believe that God is uh, choosing from among human beings those who are picking from among the best options available to them. And as much as I believe that Islam is the truth that uh, should be accepted, I recognize that not everyone can share this outlook uh, because uh, people have had different experiences. So while I'm committed, committed to the faith of Islam, uh, I uh, at the same time respect others who hold to other faiths. And having said that now, I want to approach our question. To what extent uh, does studying the life of Paul uh, throw light on the questions that we raised? Why is Christianity so different in terms of the attitude towards law, in terms of Christology or the view of Christ and uh, how that relates to monotheism, and in terms of the theology of the cross? Now, I will share with uh, uh, Professor Shillington uh, the view that Paul is not uh, the founder of Christianity. Um, however, I would say that uh, Paul, though be not being the founder of Christianity, has nevertheless uh, left a lasting impression on what is commonly called Christianity today, even though that Christianity is, as Dr. Shillington says, not monolithic, but uh, is composed of many branches and streams of thought. In other words, what is mainly considered Christian today owes uh, a lot to St. Paul, and these three, I, these three areas of inquiry, in fact, can be credited very squarely 
uh, to uh, the emphasis that St. Paul has left uh, concerning these three areas in his writings. I'd like to show how this developed over time. Now, we must remember that Jesus uh, was born within a Jewish setting. His uh, mother was Jewish, and the New Testament rightly shows us that Jesus was brought up according to Jewish practices. He was circumcised on the eighth day, and, and so on. Um, and so we see that his disciples too with him were very much Jewish. They were the Aramaic speaking persons, uh, including the group that found offense to some of the preachings of Stephen and later on we'll see to Paul uh, later on. These um, followers of Jesus naturally maintained uh, their position within Judaism and we can see in Acts of the Apostles Christianity's first history book which is now one of the parts of the Bible that these Christians uh, were not called Christians at the time but they continued to attend the synagogues they continued to pray at the usual Jewish prayer times and uh, for all that we can gather these were people making up a subset of Judaism. They followed the law, they held to the worship of Yahweh, the one true God, and now some questions remain about the theology of the cross, which would be too complex for me to address at the moment, but we'll get to this. Now eventually, the writings of Paul would be the first parts of the New Testament to be written. Dr. Shillington has already mentioned this. The uh, first letter to the Thessalonians, written in the year 50, is now one of the 27 books that make up the New Testament. It was the first of these books. But in terms of arrangement, it is not uh, given first. The Gospels are given first. And this gives the impression to the casual reader that the Gospels were written first, but in fact they were not. The four Gospels we now have, which depict the life and teachings of Jesus, in the New Testament, in fact, were all written after the writings of Paul and after, of course, Paul has left his impression. Now, two major streams developed after Jesus. One is the stream of which his own disciples uh, were ahead. That include figureheads such as Peter and later on James, the brother of Jesus. This group were Aramaic-speaking people. They continued to hold on to the Jewish law and to what we would refer to as a low Christology because they worshipped in the temples along with uh, Jews. They continued to direct their worship only to Yahweh, the one true God. And we can see some gleanings of some of their preachings in Acts of the Apostles in chapter 4, for example, where they spoke about the God of our fathers, meaning the God of Abraham and Isaac and so on. They were speaking about the monotheistic God, and they referred to Jesus as the servant of this one God. That we can find mentioned in Acts chapter 3, verse number 13, and Acts chapter 4, verse number 25. And they saw Jesus as one through whom God had performed many miracles. Jesus as the agent through whom God was working miracles. So uh, according to the way it is stated there in Acts chapter 2, in the words of Peter, uh, Jesus was a man approved by God, through whom God performed all of these miracles and so on. So we see here a monotheism continuing and the adherence to the law. But then what Paul was preaching apparently ran afoul with uh, these Jewish Christians, as we would now call them. Uh, Dr. Shillington has already shown that uh, some of these uh, Aramaic-speaking uh, Jews, many of them who are now Christians, found offense to some of the things that Stephen was saying against the law, against the temple. We see that these people also found offense to what Paul was putting in his letters and what he was preaching elsewhere. Now, Paul was a very great historical figure, and in examining his life, I don't want to say anything derogatory, especially since he is held in high esteem uh, by many who profess to be Christians. So, I want to just explore the subject uh, as a matter of academic interest. 
as much as we believe in the faiths that we follow, uh, we want to understand them academically. We want to look at the history. We want to look at the social background, the context in which they develop. We want to look at the very, very way, varying ways in which uh, they evolved over time. Now, Paul in his writings is at times a vac vacillating, oscillating between two different positions. Should we follow the law or should we not follow the law? And this oscillation, in fact, has continued uh, in all of the mainstream denominations. One is not quite sure. Should we go like the Seventh-day Adventists and at least uphold the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments? Or should we cannot be like the Jews to uphold all of the um, 365 laws. But how much of the law should we obey and how much should we not? One section of Paul's writings would seem to indicate that we do not have to follow the law and we shouldn't follow the law. Another section seems, seems to indicate that, well, we should follow the law because we cannot uh, pursue a life of lawlessness. In fact, some people misunderstood the writings of Paul as though this would indicate that now they can go ahead and do whatever they want because Jesus died for their sins. They are now saved. But Paul would have to write to them and tell them that, no, that's not what I mean. What, what I do mean is that you still have to follow the law, but since Jesus died for you, and since the grace of God has been poured out for you, you should, in response to that grace, be good. So you should follow the law anyhow. But then, if you should follow the law, then uh, we should understand then that our Christian friends would follow the law. But then, how much of the law? How about the circumcision law, for example? This is one of the laws, and uh, it is given in Genesis chapter 17 as uh, a mark of the covenant from God, saying that whoever does not do this has broken my covenant. Of course, we're speaking here of male circumcision. Now. Uh, Paul says to circumcise or not to circumcise doesn't matter. What matters is keeping the law. And in this way, Paul often uses conf confusing language in his writings. Because, of course, circumcision is part of the law. How do you mean? It doesn't matter to circumcise or not circumcise. What matters is keeping the law. Um, so uh, folks are left in some sort of difficulty concerning this. Some think, well, if we as Christians would uh, ignore all of the law, well, at least we should hold on to the Ten Commandments because this was given to Moses in a special way. It was kept in the Ark of the Covenant. It was uh, something really special. So surely that has to be kept. But now the fourth commandment is to observe the Sabbath. And that is not generally kept except, of course, by the Seventh-day Adventists and some others. So the, the, the legacy left here by Paul on the Christian denominations is very great, and we can see that it is one that uh, was opposed by uh, other Christians from the start, uh, those who were the Aramaic speaking, the original followers of Jesus, and the stream that followed from their lead. Now, this stream would not continue for very long, uh, because the documents in the New Testament, for one thing, does not come from that stream. The closest thing we have from that, uh, or reflecting teachings from that stream, is Matthew's Gospel, or some parts of it. Like, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus is uh, recorded to have said that you must keep all of the commandments. Whoever breaks the smallest one of these will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. This is an overemphasis, it would seem, on the law, but nevertheless, it, uh, some scholars think that the, this is Matthew's uh, overemphasis in response to those who do not want to practice the law. But that overemphasis, though it is, it nevertheless, it nevertheless reflects the reality that uh, the early followers of Jesus did, in fact, continue to observe the law. So these are the difficulties that we do have. We have James in the New Testament, which also insists uh, on following the law and uh, speaks against justification by faith alone in James chapter 2. So that's about the law. Now, about the Christology. Now, Dr. Shillington has given a number of uh, incidents to, from the writings of Paul to show that Paul was in fact uh, reporting on or, or building on previous tradition. There were others before Paul who said some of these things, like for example Stephen. But notice that Stephen was not one of the original disciples of Jesus. 
he and Paul and others were of a different uh, brand altogether. They were the Hellenists, uh, were Jews who had become Hellenized. And uh, the in nature of uh, Hellenistic monotheism was uh, to some extent a little different from uh, the monotheism as it was strictly followed within the more orthodox circles. But Paul would take this further. And Paul in his writings would now make Jesus as the agent of God's creation. So you have the one God, Paul says, and you have the one Lord. And that one Lord is Jesus. So where is the Old Testament? Here again Paul uses confusing language. Because the Old Testament says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. So there's a mention of the, in there of the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So Paul sees here two mentions. There's a mention of God and there's a mention of Lord. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6, Paul is explaining this and says there is only one God and one Lord. So now he makes them two. He doesn't use God and Lord as two designations for the same person. He now uses them as though they are two. So he designates the Father as God and Jesus as the Lord, through whom God made all things. This um, legacy of Paul, in fact, would re be reflected in the way the Gospels are written. Remember I've said the Gospels are written after Paul. And now we see that Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels to be written according to the general consensus of, Muslim, of uh, uh, modern New Testament uh, scholarship today. This consensus holds that uh, Mark is the first to be written and that uh, Matthew and Luke uh, apparently have used Mark as their basis. So they were composing based on what Mark has already written and uh, they would in their own ways uh, improve the material as they record them in their own individual Gospels. So we can see today as we study Mark uh, and Matthew and Luke besides Mark, we can see how the story has been improved along Christian lines in both Matthew and Luke. We can see a development of the idea concerning Jesus. So if Jesus appears uh, weak in Mark, he appears very powerful in, in Matthew and Luke. If Jesus heals some people in Mark, he healed all of them in Matthew and Luke. If Jesus appeared to not have a piece of knowledge in Mark, he appears to have it in Matthew and Luke, and so on. We can see this episode after episode. We're dealing with the same events, but the events have been reworked. Now, of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not all writing at the same time, and they were not writing with the hopes that the same people will read all of their writings. They were writing in different areas. It is in the second century of Christianity that uh, all of these documents were compiled together into the one book. And it would be in, Paul, in John's writing, the last of the four Gospels, that we would find a full reflection of the Pauline theology that Jesus is the agent through which God created the world. And we find this from the very start in, in John's Gospel. John begins by telling us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so on. And through this, God created the heavens and the earth, and this sort of thing. So, we have it here that... Uh, there is a preaching of Paul of what we call a high Christology. And then we have the Gospels being written over time after Paul, struggling in some way to record the reminiscences of what Jesus was and what he preached and what he did. But over time, that recollection itself it receives modification until we get to the Gospel of John where Paul's theology of Jesus being uh, the agent of God through which everything else is created comes to full reflection. And of course that would develop even further so that in the Council of Nicaea in the year 325 eventually it would be declared that Jesus is very God of very God and then the Chalcedonian Creed would eventually develop from that and become the creed of mainstream Christianity. So we see then this development development of high Christology in the writings of Paul. Now there might have been other people such as Stephen and other Hellenists who preached a high Christology, but it is uh, through Paul's uh, writings that this has become a, a mainstay of Christianity and it is um, 
a, a teaching that we do not trace back to the original followers of Jesus for the very fact that we do, we do not have any writings that uh, definitely are from them. Some of the writings that bear their names uh, are disputed in modern circles. For example, the second letter of Peter is uh, unanimously agreed from among ancient scholars and modern to be not from Peter. The first letter, scholarly opinion is divided about. Some say from Peter, some say not from Peter. And uh, the letter of James is said to be not really from James, but somebody who um, sees himself as writing on behalf of, of James, some follower of uh, James's thought, for example. And now we come to the last of the three points, the theology of the cross. Most people are unaware to what extent Paul has contributed to uh, the, this theology and some of the confusing elements in this theology. Dr. Shillington has noted in the book of Romans, Paul begins by uh, declaring Jesus to be the son of David. Now, uh, three uh, sorts of messiahs were expected, and this is confirmed by findings in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There, the Jews at the time of Jesus expected three individuals who might be each termed the messiah. Uh, a priestly messiah, a descendant of Aaron, a king messiah, a descendant of David, and an eschatological prophet. Each one of these could be called the messiah. Now, Paul, by declaring Jesus to be the son of David, has made it necessary later on for Matthew and Luke to try and construct uh, genealogies to prove that Jesus is really a descendant of David. And their genealogies fall short because they can only name Joseph as a descendant of David, and by all counts, they, Joseph is not the father of Jesus, except by adoption. But Paul goes on to say that uh, Jesus is the seed of David, and he couldn't be by those genealogies. And so we have difficulties here compounded upon difficulties, and uh, we find the theology of the cross here starting out uh, with misnaming Jesus as a descendant of, of David. Now why is this important? If he were that descendant of David, if he were that Messiah, then it, he would be required to restore Israel, to drive out the occupying Roman forces, to bring the kingdom of God established in the world so that the law of God should rule and uh, the Jewish leaders should sit on top. In fact, it, uh, it, many think that the 12 disciples should have been the, the ruler. Some of the disciples are noted in the Gospels are asking for this kind of position. The difficulty, though, is that if he were this Davidic Messiah, then and he should have brought about this rule, he didn't. The moment, one moment, he's in the uh, Roman court, is in the Jewish courts, uh, claiming that he is the Messiah. The next day, he's out hanging on a cross. He did not fulfill what this Davidic Messiah should have fulfilled. And this created a tremendous uh, uh, difficulty for Christian apologetics. How do we show that Jesus was the true Messiah if everything about him now appears false with the, with the cross? And so one has to now go to great difficulty to try and show that Jesus actually resurrected from the dead so that the cross did not defeat him. And though he did not appear to his enemies now to confirm that he really is alive, he will come back a second time, at which time he will show that he is alive and that he is bringing about the kingdom of God and that everything is fine. He is, after all, the true Messiah. Moreover, the theology of the cross involves the idea that Jesus died as an innocent person for the sins of others, and this itself is a difficult notion to grasp. And so altogether, we see that there are three areas in which Christianity is very different from Judaism and Islam, the attitude towards the law, the Christology or the theology about Jesus and how he stands in relationship to God, and third, the theology of the cross with all the difficulties it entails. If these uh, can uh, be revised in Christianity as we look at Paul's contribution, we realize that these came from a stream that did not originate from the disciples of Jesus, then Christianity would become closer to Judaism in some sense and much closer to Islam, for we share so much in common, especially our respect and love and adoration of Jesus. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Shabir Ali, for your presentation on the topic. This now concludes the first part of our program. We will now enter the second portion of our program today. Each of our distinguished speakers will be allowed 10 minutes 